Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight to hear me speak. I'll try to be as entertaining as I can when I'm talking about a terrible subject. It's kind of a tall order. So just like the kids of today, I too was a child of a pandemic. This is a picture of me at eight years old, the year that the first eight. And I watched on the evening news as Ryan White became infected from a some heads nodding from a certain generation of people. And I watched as people like Freddie Mercury and come to this virus. There were devastating images on the evening news at that time. In the United States, we were watching these images of these young men in the primes of their lives dying and wasting away from this devastating viral infection. But these were the images that got me because I was a kid. I remember the, e the evening news showing images of these orphanages in Africa actually absolutely bursting at the seams with all the newly created orphans who had lost one or both parent, parents to HIV AIDS. In fact, the current count is that 18 million children have lost one or both parents to just this one virus. And so this impacted, watching these pictures night after night impacted me profoundly and set the course of my life. Just a small comment about Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa has been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. It has 10% of the world's population, but 70% of the HIV infections. In fact, so many parents and working age adults were killed by this virus that the median age on the continent of Africa today is 19. It's a continent of teenagers. In Niger, the median age is 14. So when COVID came out and the world was worried about COVID hitting Africa, those of us in the HIV field weren't worried because we knew it was a continent of teenagers and COVID wasn't going to do much there. Okay, so I'm obsessed with this virus and this pandemic and seeing it to an end. Um, my passion project is to answer this little question right here. After 40 years, why don't we have an HIV vaccine? Why do we have vaccines for many viruses, but this one is so elusive? So my lab spends a lot of time working on that. But first, I want to give you some statistics about where we are with HIV AIDS in 2024. It, this virus has infected over 80 million people. We have 8 billion people on the planet today. So in today's population standards, that's one out of 100 people have contracted HIV. Half of these have died and half are still living. Um, HIV infection is not like COVID. You don't get over it after seven days or three weeks or three months. You never get over it. For every single person, it is a chronic and lifelong infection and nobody recovers. Your infection, if you are infected, you have to manage that infection with drugs for life, and there is no cure. So you will take drugs forever. Um, it is very traumatizing to those that are infected. You have to disclose that you're HIV infected to every future person that you might have sex with. You might lose your job in certain parts of the world because you're HIV infected. In some parts of the world, you might be banished from your town because you're HIV infected and nobody wants to touch you. So the mental health load of this virus is almost worse than the physical health load. And during this hour that I'm going to speak to you, I just want to honor the fact that 148 new infections will occur and 75 deaths will occur from this virus. And importantly, there is no vaccine for you to protect yourself from this blood and se blood-borne and sexually transmitted disease. But let's step back a minute. Where did HIV come from? Why did we hear about it for the first time in 1981? Well, it came from the same place that all new human viruses come from. I'll give you a snapshot of the zoonoses that have happened in about the last 10 years, okay? In 2012, we had a new virus coming from camels and infecting people in the Middle East with a 35% fatality rate meaning if you got it, you had only two out of three chance of surviving that infection. In China in 2013, we saw a new bird flu start to infect people. There was a huge Ebola epidemic in Guinea that came from bats. In Brazil in 2015, we saw Zika jumping presumably out of primates. 
in the Congo. We had then a different Ebola outbreak, again coming from bats. In India, we had Nipah coming from bats. In China, we then had SARS-CoV-2 coming presumably from bats. And in the 2022, we had monkeypox coming out of African rodents and first being detected in the United Kingdom. Just 10 years. This is just 10 years. And I want to show you that these viruses tend to have one of two properties. Because they are newly born viruses, they tend to be either incredibly deadly to humans. If they're incredibly deadly, they don't spread very well. Because when you kill people really fast, you don't spread very well. Okay? So the ones that are a little less deadly go pandemic. So it's really like picking the worst of two evils here. You know, neither scenario is good. OK, but these are just the pandemics that got, sorry, these are just the zoonoses that got big enough that you heard about them on the evening news. This is actually happening all the time. And most infections of humans with animal viruses die out and don't make it onto NPR. So this is, that list I just showed you is really just the tip of the iceberg, the big ones that you heard about on CNN. What's going on under the surface? What about all the little ones, the false starts that never take off? Is there a place that we can learn about those or record those? Yeah, there is. There's a really cool website called ProMed. It's just a website where doctors and vets from around the world write in blog posts about weird infections they're seeing in humans and animals and ask each other for information. So here I pulled off just the post from yesterday. And including, we've got one, I read this one, people are getting pig hepatitis E from contaminated sausages. So enjoy your bratwurst tonight. <laughs> and so this is really, these are the, you know, did you hear about this? When you came tonight? No, of course. Did you hear about any of these? No. Because when just a few people are infected, they don't make the news. This is what's happening under the water, and it's happening all the time. Let me show you a couple ProMed posts that I pulled out so you could read. These all come from just the last few weeks. February 23rd, avian influenza, human China. The Center for Health Protection in China today said that a human case of influenza A infection announced earlier in a 22-month girl has been confirmed as H9N2. According to the whole genome sequencing result, it's believed that the H9N2 virus isolated from a sample of the patient is of avian bird origin. Also, they announced that one of her home contacts had presented with upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. It's spreading. Okay, somebody else got it. A stringent surveillance mechanism is firmly in place. You guys feel good about that? I got that under control? Suspected cases will be immediately referred to public hospitals for follow-up investigation. So, did you hear about this one? No. Happening every day. Here's another one. March 1st, just a couple days ago. Loss of fever. Nigeria, fatal. No fewer than nine people have died of loss of fever virus in Benu State in the past two months. The state epidemiologist noted that some of the dead victims lived in internally displaced person camps, persons camps. F poor food storage in the camps may lead to the contamination of food supplies by the loss of virus vector, the African soft bird rat. This could be the source of the outbreak. Thereafter, person-to-person -person spread can occur during, due to overcrowding. So this is the iceberg under the water. This is what's happening all the time. So the synopsis of my talk is that zoonosis is happening all the time, all over the world, every single day. Most human infections probably go undetected, even on ProMed. We never even see them, let alone you know, get some report of them. It's hard to know from the beginning which one of these zoonoses are going to go big and which are just going to die out. It's easy to look back and say, why didn't you people act earlier on SARS-CoV-2? Uh, because we're watching this happen every single day. It's really hard to predict which ones are going to result in the Himalayan mountain of death that followed that zoonosis, right? OK, so that's what we're up against. So the outline of my talk today is I'm going to tell you, you know, I and others have been studying this field for a lot of years now. So we're going to talk about how does zoonosis work exactly? I eat undercooked meat and pet dogs and ingest animal viruses all the time, and usually they don't hurt me. So how does it go wrong? And what can we do about it? What are the tools we have today? And what are the tools we need to do better in the future? This is a schematic of a human cell. It's got a nucleus. It's got lots of proteins in it. And this up here is HIV. 
And this is a very precise diagram of HIV doing its business, going through its life cycle, making more copies of itself, and then, oops, there come children popping out the other side. So it's making more copies. That's how it makes you sick. What this diagram is showing is there are the 100 human proteins that HIV uses the function of during that process. And we know that because scientists can delete each one of these proteins, and when they delete just one, HIV doesn't make any children. And so we know that the ratio, and this is probably true for most viruses, is something very extreme, where just a small number of viral proteins plus a huge number of human proteins, all of which has to work just right for the virus, equals a successful infection. Okay, so zoonosis requires a human-compatible virus, right? So we know a lot of things in the literature suggest that if we took bats or any animal and, like, took a syringe and pulled all their viruses out of them and stuck them in my arm, nothing's going to happen most of the time because those are bat viruses adapted for bat cells to replicate inside those cells and to be perfect for the bat and not perfect for me. So we know that there are four properties of an animal virus that can jump to humans, okay? Like I just told you, it has to be able, a successful animal virus has to be able to enter human cells. Remember, it can't replicate on the table, and that's a regulated process, so that's a trick. The virus has to pull off. It then, like I just told you, has to use all those complicated human cellular proteins to make children and make you sick and get other people sick. But then, oh yeah, we also have this massive immune response, sorry, immune system that protects us. So a successful animal virus would also have to resist our whole innate immune system, which is many, many cell types patrolling our bodies. And also, it's going to have to evade our antibodies. So if we've ever been infected by a virus that's anywhere similar to this before, we'll have memory and be protected. So all those things have to go right for an animal virus to infect us. So you might ask yourself, well, given all these criteria, it seems unlikely that zoonosis would ever occur at all. How does this work? How does the bat virus just magically have all these properties, right? And so let's take influenza virus as an example where I can demonstrate to you how that can happen. And I will take influenza A virus because before COVID, this was the number one virus that everybody in my field worried about. Okay, we all thought the next pandemic would be influenza. It has caused four pandemics in the last hundred years, including the 1918 flu. And influenza has a propensity for making new human compatible versions of itself through a very tricky mechanism. But so many criteria, this must be a very high tech situation that's yielding these viruses with these amazing properties. It is very high tech, let me tell you. This is where new flu viruses emerge from pig farms all over the world. And you might be asking yourself, why pigs? What's special about pigs? Well, let me tell you. So I mentioned that flu is an avian virus, okay? And humans, we have our seasonal flus, just a few of them. We have about four strains, four flavors that infect us every year. Those are called seasonal flus here in blue. And in the, for the most part, we don't get infected with bird flus, except for that little 22-month-old girl in China on ProMed and some examples like that who do get infected with avian flus. But pigs are a very special animal referred to as a mixing vessel for flus because pigs have a very unique ability to be infected by both avian flus and human flus. And if this, you know, think about ducks sitting on their trough you know, while they're drinking, and then humans coming along and shoveling in the farm. I mean, these things are mixing, right? And so what happens, I'm going to now show you a cross-section of these viruses, like I showed you a cross-section before. Flu is different than HIV, because just like our cells, this virus has chromosomes. They're called segments. But flu has eight segments inside that encodes its, that contains its genetic code. And the blue human viruses have, you know, human segments, and avian viruses have avian segments. And if a pig gets both infections at once, which seems unlikely, but, you know, all it takes is once, we can get a hybrid virus where these segments mix, and we have the birth of a new human virus. And all four influenza pandemics of the last 100 years that we have documented information about started in this way. So this is a really like important thing to understand. But the problem is that we don't know really how this happens. How do these 
pit, these avian and human segments get in the same virus. We don't understand this because these segments are so small that they're really hard to see. Okay, so I was interested in this problem, and um, I. One of the great things that helped me solve it is that I'm here in this building where we blend new technologies. So in, in all honesty, I have a wonderful graduate student named Emma Warden-Sapper who's here tonight. She twisted my arm into becoming interested in this problem, wanted to tackle it. Roy, who's an expert in RNA, started explaining to me new technologies that would allow you to amplify the signal from a single RNA so you could see it. And then we have a microscopy guru here, Joe Dragovan, who taught me, about, taught me and Emma about the microscopes that could be used to do that. And lo and behold, we did this. We are, have, um, for the first, uh, we have a, I'm going to show you what this is in just a second, but this is the first time that anyone has been able to visualize all eight segments of flu sorting themselves out into new virions within a cell. And so this is what you're looking at is a single cell imaged eight times. It's a single cell infected with flu. It could be a pig cell or any other type of cell. And we have each of the eight segments colored a unique color so that we can watch how they are sorting and moving throughout that cell. We now have the capacity to watch this process that we call reassortment, where bird and human flu segments come together. And we have a collaborator that has the ability to perform these dual infections in pigs in a controlled and safe environment where we can watch this happening in the actual setting where these pandemic viruses emerge. Okay. So after we have a human compatible variant, like that flu virus that the pig produced for us. The next step is opportunity. That human, that pig has to now give that back to a human. Or um, whatever animal is the source of this virus has to come in contact with the human. Okay, so how likely is that? Okay, well there are 1.6 million animal virus species in the world and 8 billion human targets. There's a lot of mixing between humans and animals in the world. Here we have two ladies working at a chicken processing plant in Asia, and you can see those chickens are alive just, you know, three feet away from where they're slaughtering them. This is a young boy in Africa with his pet spot-nosed guin on. So all kinds of human-animal interactions are happening all over the world. So you might think to yourself, like, is this even an issue, right? Well, you know, there are some very special circumstances that have presented opportunity in special ways. And I'm going to tell you the story, one of the most amazing stories of how opportunity has facilitated a viral epidemic in this case. It involves Ebola virus, which is a virus specific to Africa, which is incredibly fatal. The different strains have between 40 to 90 percent fatality rate. So you do not have good odds if you get infected with one of these viruses. Ebola virus is believed to be harbored by African bats. And it infects humans, but it also infects apes, monkeys, and even some large mammals. Okay, so we're not the only thing that it infects. When a human gets infected by, an, you can see this is a hunter, right? When a human, he possibly, the bat in this scenario has infected a monkey that he's now going to take home, presumably as food. And that's how these infections can happen. When a, a human becomes, and you can see there's blood, you know, because we're hunting, right? When a human becomes infected with an animal virus, the first human is called the index case. So in this cartoon, this is our index case. With Ebola, it's very deadly. So one of two things are going to happen. Within about 24 hours, this person is going to be in a healthcare situation, either in an Ebola clinic or at home, if there is no Ebola clinic. And if they die, their body is going to be handled in some way for a funeral. And these are the ways that then more people get infected by this virus, okay? I haven't gotten to the opportunity part. So I'm going to tell you about the biggest Ebola virus outbreak that has ever happened on the planet. It happened in 2014, 2015. Raise your hand if you heard about that or if you remember. Oh, man, we got all these, like, snooze listeners and science lovers here. Okay. So anyway, it, was the big, it, it uh, infected something like 11,000 people, and you can see the fatality right here. So no good. Okay. This pandemic, this ep sorry, epidemic started in Miliandu, Guinea. The index case was a toddler in this little village that only has 20 homes. 
The um, toddler got sick in December 2014, and right after she died, her parents died, and then most of the village died, okay? So when that happened, and then it spread from there. When that happened, a team of epidemiologists was sent to Miliandu to investigate this situation, like what happened? Because these Ebola outbreaks do happen sometimes, and so we try to learn whatever we can when they do. And when they went down to this village, the remaining villagers, of which there weren't many, told them about this tree, which was just yards from the toddler's house. Whoops. Oh, God. So the villagers told them that the kids used to play down here. Oh, of course they did. It looks fun, right? My kids are here. Would you guys play in there? It looks like a tent, right? Yeah. And at the top of this tree is, the roosting, is a roosting, common roosting site for some migratory bats, including the Angolan free-tailed bat, who, which had just migrated through this tree right before the toddler became sick. So a hypothesis emerged that a bat-filled tree may have been ground zero for the Ebola epidemic. You get it. Kids are playing down below. Bats are pooping. Maybe the kids are playing with bats, which the villagers said they did do. And so to substantiate, Ebola has, there's an enigma in this field, Ebola has actually never been isolated from a bat, so given this clue, you better believe a space-suited team from the World Health Organization and the CDC was sent down there to sample bats, and sadly, by the time they got there, possibly understandably, the remaining villagers had burned that tree down, so we will never know the answer to this mystery. But this is an example of opportunity, a very specific scenario. We can trace the beginning of this epidemic potentially to a single tree. Okay, so once you have your index case, we're marching through the steps here. We've got a human compatible virus. We've got our first sick person. We've got a sick person here, not sick people here. The clock in the back of the room is not working, so I'm watching. Okay, so if a virus infects an index case, an animal virus infects an index case and nobody else, that's pretty boring. That's going to go on ProMed, and you're never going to hear about it, right? Maybe it won't even go on ProMed. Maybe nobody will ever even pick up on it. The problem is when other people start getting sick, okay? And so sometimes viruses have to refine themselves after they've infected that index case for better spread in humans because it takes different properties to spread in humans than that initial animal-to-human transmission took. And so that's exactly what was happening with COVID. Remember our friends Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Omicron? Those were increasingly good at spreading between humans. And we know in molecular detail what those mutations were that were making them better. And so um, that was after, this was the index case virus, but it was pretty crappy at spreading between people, so then it mutated, got better. There are different colors because they're gaining mutations. That's what a variant is. Okay, so we have been studying this process of viruses refining themselves for spread, okay? So we study a reservoir of viruses in Africa, harbored in African monkeys and apes called simian immunodeficiency viruses. I've mentioned that virus before because that's the virus that transmitted to humans and gave rise to HIV. So we actually know of 13 index cases, 13 people that have been infected with SIV. They're in the literature. Okay, 12 of those were duds, and one of those yielded the jackpot transmission that resulted in 80 million people being infected in the HIV AIDS pandemic. So what's that all about? Well, I'll be a little more specific. One of these index cases started the, was the birth of a new human virus that we call HIV group P, okay? And it infected one person, and we never saw it again. One of these index cases, we named, we named their virus HIV group N, it infected 20 people-ish. Went away, never saw it again. One of them, this index case, we named their virus group O, you can see a pattern here, and that one infected about 100,000 people and is still simmering around. But none of these are the jackpot. And, and these other arrows, I'm not gonna go through all 13, but they're every scenario in between, from one to 30 to, you know. And so what you can see that all of these were successful zoonoses. It's the refinement for spread that can be very different from one time to another. And so I have a team that's been working on this reservoir for a long time. Vanessa Bauer, TJ Adesina, um, a a Ava. Oh my God, I'm like spacing your name, last name, Ava. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Sam Chappelle. I'm not saying anyone's names anymore. Okay. I only write her a paycheck every month, you'd think. Okay, so we work on, this team works on this, this reservoir and asks the question, what was it about this one that made it so different, right? We also have another reservoir we work on. This looks the same, but this is now in Asia and Africa, so the primates have changed. I put some baby monkeys in there for Avery and Audrey. You guys like that? Okay. This dengue virus reservoir involves mosquitoes as well, so I'm going to draw a mosquito up there. Mosquitoes bite the monkeys, then they bite the humans, and that's how they get infected. So this one has also infected about, we have about 20 index cases that have gotten infected with these forest dengue viruses. Most of them have petered out, but we've had four jackpots in this scenario, giving rise to the four dengue viruses, much more simply named, one, two, three, and four, that we now have to live with for the rest of eternity. So four dengue viruses circulate the globe, infect 400 million people a year, some percentage of those have pretty serious situations, um, and it's a huge deal in the tropics. And so, um, you know, we have a team as well here. Arturo, Paul, and Misha are saying, what would it take for this to happen again? This one's happened four times. Is really, we're done? Is that it? You know, the, it's true, like, the primates are all going extinct. That might help, but I don't want them to go extinct. So how does this, how does this stop, and how do we not get number five? What does it take to, for a successful um, zoonosis of these viruses? Okay, so switching subjects here, that's the end of my little spiel, and this will go more quickly. What can we do about this? Okay, we have three tools in the fight against these new viruses, these pandemic and epidemic viruses. We have vaccines, drugs, and public health measures. And these things work, right? This is an amazing graph published by the CDC, just showing the deaths in the U.S. to infectious disease over 100 years. What we've got on the y-axis is deaths per 100,000 population per year. So, in other words, it's normalized to the population because the population grew. And what you can see is that um, my laser pointer has stopped, but what you can see, I got another one here, what you can see is that public health measures work. We, well, first of all, you'll notice the giant 1918 influenza spike, okay? I just got to mention that stinking virus killed more people in 25 weeks than HIV killed in its first 25 years. That was a major pandemic. It was quick, went away quickly, but that's why it looks like the spike it does. Okay, so we have health departments. We put chlorine in our water. We uh, have antibiotics now. We got vaccines and we enforced their usage or at least, you know, recommended it. And all of those things, look how much we've driven down the, our deaths due to infectious disease. So the question is, if all this works, if all the public health measures works, why do we still have pandemics and epidemics? Here's the problem. In medicine, we only use diagnostics to known pathogens. If we have seven people go to their local health clinic and say, I feel terrible, tell me what's wrong with me, give me something to make me feel better, um, the doctor may run some tests and might tell these six people that they have these six common respiratory viruses. But this seventh person, maybe they run all their tests, and they're all negative. You know, you might say, like, Sarah, that's unlikely to happen. But let me ask you this. How many times, doctors in the audience, cl close your ears, okay? But the rest of you, how many times have you been into the doctor, and the doctor's like, actually, I don't even know if what you have is bacterial or viral. I'm just going to give you some antibiotics. And if it makes you feel better, then you probably had a bacterial infection. Raise your hand if you've had that conversation with your doctor. So that's how, like, draconian this can be, right? We don't diagnose a lot of infections. In fact, 30 to six, the literature shows, many studies on this have been performed, 30 to 60% of patients, even with severe fever, fever is a common indicator of infection, receive no definitive diagnosis. They just go home. Why is it important that we diagnose this purple lady and don't just let her go home? Because she might be infected with a new human virus. You know, she could just be a difficult case but she could be infected with a new virus that came from animals. What if this is the index case in the next human pandemic? Are we just going to want to and just not? Let me show you some examples where exactly this has happened. This is a ProMed post that a doctor posted, and he titled it in bold, Request for Information. Ten people have died from an unknown disease in a remote village along the Owen-Stanley Range in Papua New Guinea. 
The symptoms include painful swellings from the legs, which then spread to the arms and hands, the stomach, and then the head before it kills the person. Ten villagers in Upper Musa along the two main rivers had contracted this disease, causing the middle and lower Musa people to fear for their lives because of the risk of infection. They're fearful that the disease may be waterborne as they are located downstream from the inf affected area. So this is an example of undiagnosed infections. Did you hear about this? No. It was like 10 years ago. And guess what? Nobody heard about it except for those of us watching ProMed, and nobody ever figured out what was wrong with these people. The situation just resolved. What about this one? Also undiagnosed infection. This one's a pneumonia out of China. A total of 44 patients with pneumonia of unknown etiology have been reported to the World Health Organization by the national authorities. Of the 44 cases, 11 are severe, severely ill, while the remaining 33 are in stable condition. The causal agent has not yet been identified or confirmed. The clinical signs and symptoms are mainly fever, with a few patients having difficulty breathing, and chest radiographs showing invasive lesions of both lungs. Based on the information provided, the WHO's recommendations on public health measures and surveillance still apply and do not recommend any specific measures for travelers. Very similar to the last case, people with something that's undiagnosed. Only this one really mattered because I'm going to put the date on here. This was the first report that China made to the World Health Organization about SARS-CoV-2, right? And at this point, we didn't have any reason to know that this was different than the one I put on the previous slide. And so we figured out COVID using next generation sequencing. Some people may know that. So I want you, I want to think about this for a minute. You know, many of you know about sequencing. We can, we can sequence DNA and RNA by taking one extra step and turning it to DNA. So why don't we just in, diagnose this lady by sequencing her samples? Actually, this is almost never used for diagnosis in infectious disease in healthcare settings, next gen sequencing. And here's why. Um, it only works, you can only use sequencing during the acute phase of infection. So this person still has to have a lot of virus in their body for me to pull out and sequence. If they're in recovery and suffering from all the downstream things, like long COVID patients, I'm not going to recover COVID from their bodies, you know, but they have all the downstream ramifications. Antibodies linger after you're infected, but infection, the virus itself is in your body for a short period of time. Um, you'll find viruses in people every time you sequence them. I could sequence your, any of your samples and I'd find weird viruses. Knowing which one is making you sick is a whole nother issue. And so proof requires sequencing plus epidemiological investigation. That's why COVID was so, such a sweet spot because we had so many freaking cases so fast. But like they all have the same virus in their sequencing. This must be the causal agent. But this is epidemiology is is costly and slow. You have to have a lot of cases. You can't perform clinical trials on viruses not yet known to science. Thus, there's no FDA approval for using sequencing to discover, to diagnose viruses we don't know exist yet. And sequencing is available in science labs, but the movement of human si samples into science labs is tricky and slow. Okay, so what can we do in the future? It's my last little bit. I'll wrap up here. Um, we recently laid out a vision in an article that we wrote for exactly this. How do we diagnose this purple lady? Okay, she's appearing all over the world every day. Undiagnosed infection. We need diagnostic panels for potential zoonotic viruses in different parts of the world. Let me mean, say what I mean by that. Currently, PCR and antibody-based diagnostics are the most practical solution for diverse healthcare settings around the world. So imagine we have a lady in Japan who gets bitten by a tick. Doctor tests her with all known tests, negative on all of them. And, <laughs> and this lady wants to know what's wrong with her, right? So imagine if we then had a panel of high-risk animal viruses in the area where this person was that we could then test that person with in a format that's accessible in all kinds of healthcare settings around the world. Okay, so that's one thing that we need. But how do we know what animal viruses to put on these panels? Well, we have to study potentially zoonotic viruses so that we know what to put in these panels. And that's a big task. My lab has sort of taken a little bite out of that. I want to just quickly share some work by an amazing postdoc, Cody Warren. He's a professor at Ohio State now. Cody did the following screen. He has, in this experiment, 
a, some, I'm sorry, in this experiment we're using viruses that glow green. So when you see green and viruses growing, when you see black, it's just a plate of cells with no virus growth. When you take, he was analyzing monkey viruses that might be risky to humans. So most monkey viruses on monkey cells grow, because that's their host species, right? That makes sense. Most monkey viruses on human cells don't grow. But Cody was screening for this. Monkey viruses, like one that he found, that started to grow very weakly on human cells. And we, of course, followed this up with a massive investigation. The name of this virus is very disheartening. It is called simian hemorrhagic fever virus. It uh, causes hemorrhagic fever just like Ebola. This is a monkey virus poised to infect humans. This is just one small piece of the data. And we have no diagnostic test for this virus in existence. So that's um, one we need. And finally, we need to build tools that will lower the barrier to testing around the world. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say that before you leave, we have a, a gift bag for you guys. It involves me testing you for infectious diseases, OK? But you have to give me a, a sample of blood. I'm going to stick a needle in your arm. Who's going to give me that sample of blood before they leave today? All the doctors raise their hand. OK. But now let's imagine all I need is for you to spit in a tube. Would you do that? Raise your hand if you'd give me a, a tube of your stuff. Everybody, love that. OK, love that. Well, you're not alone. People do not like giving blood. This is a map of blood donations per 1,000 population with a color code. You didn't want to give me your blood, and you're even in the best possible scenario. In some parts of the world, like Africa, almost nobody will give blood. And this is, this is for blood banks, by the way. But the reason is because of the cultural and religious significance of blood. And it is different in different parts of the world, and it goes downhill from North America, let me tell you. So blood, requiring blood from people is a huge barrier uh, to this testing. OK. So we in BioFrontiers, a bunch of us, Kristen, sitting right here, who's putting on the whole party tonight, Leslie, Roy, Robin Dow, Dan Laramore, myself, and all of our labs, we had a chance during the pandemic to think about a different biospecimen, saliva. Like, could that substitute? Remember, we were running out of nasal swabs, and there were like a lot of reasons to be interested in that. This is not, COVID wasn't something you typically diagnose from blood, but it was a chance for us to road test that idea. So we developed a saliva test here at CU Boulder. We even got a banner on Pearl Street. Isn't that awesome? Look for us when you're it's still hanging up there. I saw it the other day. So home of the saliva test. So we developed the saliva test. Um, Roy and Kristen and a bunch of people here ran a quarter million tests in this building on college students, faculty, and staff. And you, as members of the community, should be very thankful to them because they found 2,000 positive college students and stuck them in the COVID dorm, therefore stopping 2,000 transmission chains in our community. 100% that saved lives. Yeah. <laughs> we were also using the data from this testing operation. We were the first to show that there were COVID-19 super spreaders. Um, we also were the first to show that spreading is directly related to viral load. That was some delicious data that came out of that COVID dorm, wasn't it? So we actually followed these students and learned some stuff. And we published research directing vaccination strategies. So we started down this saliva road. Oh, I just got to show this picture. This is in front of the building you walked in tonight. Campus closed down March 16th, 2020. Two months later, we were all not even supposed to be in the building. Two months later, we had that saliva test, and we were road testing it in front of the building for all the other people that were illegally coming in. We were having them give us saliva so we could test it out and see if we could pick up on COVID tests. You could read this sign right here. It says, help us develop our COVID test for saliva. So there we are. We, some of us have remained interested in this idea. How far could we go? What is, how deep is the diagnostic value of saliva? Could we replace blood testing? We've tried out concepts on students, on athletes, and on military personnel who've agreed to participate in our studies. And I just want to show you one more slide, and, and then I'll wrap up here. But this is an amazing study done by Sharon Wu, one of our IQ bio students here, in collaboration with SUNY Upstate along with Nick Meyerson, who um, has a company here in the building, and Dan Laramore, who's in computer science and biofrontiers. We did a study with SUNY Upstate. Listen to what I say, because you're not going to believe it. We took nine human volunteers, paid them $1,500, and they let, let us infect them with dengue virus. Okay? 
It was in a hospital setting, all controlled. Their health care was taken care of. It was a, a weakened form of dengue virus, but that's what the study involves. I'm showing you three participants in this study and the amount of, the amount of virus we can detect in the days after they're infected. Now, dengue is special because it is not COVID-19. It's not in my mouth. It's not in my saliva. Dengue is a strictly blood-borne pathogen. A mosquito delivers it to people. So it is a blood-borne pathogen. And what you can see is that if we first look at blood, the gold standard diagnostic for dengue, you can see that we could easily diagnose these people from blood, that they had dengue infection. But it only cost us about a day to diagnose them using saliva. And so in regions of the world where people won't give us their blood, maybe this is something we should be exploring because the cost is pretty minimal. And so we have many studies underway now, me, other people in this building. Saliva can lower barriers to testing. Some of us have founded a company called Darwin Biosciences based around this concept. And uh, with that, I'll just wrap up. My baby virus is sad that the talk is over. I'm sure you're happy, but animal viruses are infecting people all the time. Most of these times, the infections peter out, and you never hear about them, thankfully. If these viruses start to spread from person to person, they might cause a small epidemic or even a large pandemic. There are things we need to do to be better prepared, and all are centered around diagnosing more human infections. Stop sending people home with antibiotics right, for their viral infections. And that's in the first world. Imagine what's happening in Africa, right? So we need to study potentially zoonotic animal viruses in the lab. We need to make human diagnostics for those dangerous animal viruses so that when we have people that are failing all other tests, we can do those tests. And, you know, the use of saliva can make testing more facile because people don't want to give blood. What else can lower barriers to testing? And with that, I just really want to thank all of you for coming tonight, my amazing leadership here at BioFrontiers and my colleagues, all of the awesome, amazing CU students, postdocs, and scientists in the audience and in the building, and our wonderful Boulder community who makes, makes it all fun. Thank you for coming.